Yep. Unlock. Well, amen. Uh, I want to thank Brother Aaron for allowing me to have this opportunity. Um, I really enjoy preaching and bringing the word and teaching it. I miss doing it every week. And um, so uh, I just appreciate the opportunity. And it's wonderful you gave them an opportunity to go on vacation. I, I know Pastor and his family needs that. They need a time to get away and just relax and it's good for them and it's good for you because it gives them a chance to refocus and think of things and ministry and uh, you know where things are going. So uh, it's great that you give them the opportunity to go and be away. And then for Aaron to go to a pastor's conference, that's always refreshing and encouraging. Um, I always use sometimes when I would hear a conference or listen to a conference, I'm always looking for new ideas for preaching. Uh, and sometimes they come up with uh, thoughts and um, you don't use what they're saying, but it gives you directions in your mind. Man, I want to talk about that. And so it's good that you're getting to go, brother, and um, getting away to be with the conference. I, I want you to take your Bibles and, well, maybe you have them, maybe you don't. I know you use them over your head, um, but uh, I want you to go to Philippians chapter four. And um, then I'm also going to take you, but I'll, I'll read it for you to 1 Timothy chapter six. and several places of scripture, I wanted to preach on this morning, living with contentment and having contentment in your heart. Uh, I read this and the person says, do you know where you go to make it, to make contentment? Anybody know? The satisfactory, oh. that does it, <laughs> all right? And that's where you'll find the contentment. Um, so, uh, but we're gonna talk about contentment in our hearts and what the Bible has to say about it. And hopefully it will help us because we live in a time where contentment, discontentment seems to be the driving force. And um, I want you to look at Philippians, if you would, chapter four. Paul is writing. Uh, he's late in his ministry. Uh, Paul has learned and his time is, is uh, traveling around as a missionary. Uh, he has come to, to a place where he's learned to be content with his situations in life. And he has faced evil of men's heart in religion and in government. He's going to write there, and he writes, and he says in chapter 4, starting at verse 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, I want you to go over, if you want to go also go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 5 and 8. He says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdrawal might thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing to this world and is certain we can carry nothing out. I want you to think about contentment. Paul is writing to a young pastor in Timothy. He's a young pastor and he's trying to help him give him some instructions, uh, dealing with men who were thinking that uh, the fact if you have gain and you're, you, you get more, you have more godliness. But he's also trying to help him know how to pastor. In Philippians, this is Paul's one of Paul. He's, a, he's It's a, one of his late letters. Uh, he's writing to this church. He's in prison in Rome. Uh, and uh, it's coming really to the near end of his time. And he writes to the Philippian church trying to help them uh, and understand uh, some of the things they've been through about their giving and how they've been giving, but also the things that they are facing. Now, look, contentment means this, to be satisfied and pleased and sufficient or full. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I just pray that you speak to hearts and through the word. Help me, Lord, to bring what you have already put upon my heart. And Lord, uh, and not to say the things I shouldn't. And Lord, I just uh, pray that uh, we'll learn from the word. And Lord, we'll leave here within our hearts knowing that we do have contentment. And Lord, uh, help us to understand it. 
and how we can have it and how we can live with it. So Lord, bless those things and bless the service today and bless your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The word contentment means to be satisfied or pleased or sufficient and full. When Paul talks about content, he's saying, I'm in this situation, but I'm content. I'm satisfied. This is where God's put me. It's an internal satisfaction which does not demand changes in the external circumstance. I can have it even though the circumstance around me is hard. The world's definition of contentment would be having enough, gaining more, needing less. I'm That's right. That's right. The world's definition of contentment would be having enough, gaining more, needing, needing change. The Christian's contentment, contentment should be God is control. His plan is best, seeks to follow God's will, trust in God's goodness, love, and power. There's where we have the contentment. It was Joseph who told his brothers when they had betrayed him, sold him into slavery, and he was down in Egypt, and finally the day came where they had to come get some supply to feed their family. It was Joseph who told them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. There's the contentment. What I've gone through is it was bad, but I know God had a purpose in it. Being content requires faith, focus, and trust. We live in a world that, and isn't the truth, folks, we live in a world that drives discontentment. Commercials, politics, TV, internet, politicians, are merchants of discontent to get votes and get elected. It's alarming those who promote hate for their country and belief in God today. Are we in a world, strange world now in, in our country? It, 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 it's bothersome sometimes when you see uh, the things that are going on because it seems like it's all upside down now. That which used to be good is now bad. And that which is bad is now proclaimed as good and acceptable. And we live in that. I think for our country, though, the freedom of the press and an informed society is important for democracy, isn't it? I think one of the alarming things for me in, in, amongst so many is the freedom of the press. It, they are so controlled now. Uh, they, you're not getting what you need, the information you need, which helps. But it's, 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 it's alarming. It's alarming about the polls, about how many Christ people identify as Christians. 50 years ago, 90% in a poll said they identified as a Christian. Today, it's only 64%. It's dropped. Belief in God is changing. Why? Because in the, in, in the time we live, society is pushing, pushing a discontent and questioning the very foundation of what we've always believed. Think about how many things and crimes happen because of discontentment, thievery, murder, rape, cheating, all out of discontentment. Right now, many leaders in our country are striking a discontent fire by stoking racism and anger by their remarks in order to accomplish a certain goal. Isn't that true? I mean, they just stoke it, stoke it, all for one reason, that they either want elected or to accomplish a certain purpose in their life. We as Christians, we live in the world that is in that kind of turmoil. But how in all that world do we find contentment and be content? I want you to think about this as we talk about it. Contentment does not mean you always, you're always happy with your situation. See, I don't want us to get confused that I have contentment, but that means I have to be happy all the time. Paul, do you think Paul... Uh, was always content with what he went through. Uh, later on, I'm going to read to you where he goes to a litany of things that he faced. I'm sure he wasn't happy to be there, but he was still content. I can be discontent with what is happening around me. That's the outward. But I can have contentment in my heart because I know Christ and he is in control of my life. See, there's my contentment rests. So contentment doesn't mean everything's going to work out right and everything's going to be good and everything's going to be fine. Contentment means that I may not like this and I might want it to change, but I'm resting in God, who is my strength. 
Contentment does not mean I do not desire better or more. Just because I have contentment in my heart doesn't mean I don't want things to, to be better or may I want something more in some area. I can want something or change. I can ask God for it. And if it's his desire for me to have it, he makes a way. Where wanting something or change can be bad as if it can, where it can be bad is where I convince myself I cannot be happy without it. There's where the discontentment comes. I convince myself unless this changes in my life, I'm just always going to be miserable. I convince myself unless uh, I'm able to get that item, I just cannot be happy. I convince myself unless I make more money and able to supply this, my life is miserable and worthless. We get to that place where we convince ourselves of these things when in reality, that is not my foundation for contentment. My foundation for contentment is Jesus Christ and my Savior and my God, and that he is with me and that he guides me. The first incident of discontentment in the word of God, you have to go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis, where God, yeah, the serpent comes to Eve and first thing, and they're walking around. I mean, can you imagine what they had in the garden? They had all the food they could want. They had all the animals and the beauty of the garden that God had created. They had this walk with God. Uh, it was all there. Everything, everything a person could imagine that is theirs, that God had given them all things. But he said, one tree is just stay away from. And along comes this devil and puts a discontentment that about what God has said, the character of God, what God is intending, and that God was just holding that back from you for an evil purpose. He just don't want you to have it. And all of a sudden, a discontentment comes settling in. And we know what happened. Eventually, they took her the fruit. Eventually, she gave to her husband and sent her to the world. Contentment comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. Do we understand that? The first step in your life, you say, I want, I want contentment. I think the start talk comes first, folks, comes from first focusing on what you do have instead of dwelling what you do not. Go, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verses 5 and 6. Um, says here, let your conversation, in Hebrews, a verse, the, the word conversation is your living. Let your life, let's what, how you're, you're conducting your life. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I think when we want to get to a place of contentment, it comes from first focusing on what you do have instead of dwelling what you do not. Look, we have salvation. Look, the world can destroy us, but they can't take away our home in heaven. We can't take away that relationship by having Jesus Christ. They can't take separate me from God's love. They, the world and, and items and needs cannot separate me from the care and love of God. None of that. I have that. But sometimes, folks, we just got to focus around us. We have family. We can have family. We have friends. We get discontent when we begin to focus on those things we just do not have. You are not blessed. One man said this. You are not blessed until you recognize that you are blessed. So contentment is believing that God's provision is enough for our physical needs, that his presence is enough for our emotional needs, and that his providence is enough for my future needs. It's just focusing on it. But when it comes to contentment, I want to share this with you. Contentment is not determined by my circumstance, but by my focus. <laughs> Once you go back to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to break it down. We're going to kind of break that down. He 
You see, it's easy to have contentment, contentment when life is going well, but true contentment is tested when life goes wrong. Paul's statement is, I am content. He says, I am content. Remember, that's satisfying. He says, I am content. He says, I am content. No matter what is happening to me or where I am or whatever state I am. Look what he says in the verse. I know both how to be abased. But he says in verse 11, I have learned in whatsoever state. And you just kind of put that in your mind. But he says, I have learned in whatever state. That means whatever is happening, wherever I am at that moment, whatever is going on in my life, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whatever, wherever God has put me and where I am right now, he is saying, that's the state. He says, whatever state, whatever position I am, I, 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 I am in. I am there with to be content. It's easy to have contentment then, but Paul's statement is I'm content, satisfied, no matter what is happening to me or where I am or whatever state I am. We can go back to chapter, we can go back to Acts uh, in the Bible. Go, if you would, if you have time, go to Acts chapter 16. I want to kind of tell you where, how, how that is such a bold statement for Paul. You go to Acts chapter 16, you look at verse 23. He's talking, and Paul writes this. He said, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made. Yeah. <clears throat> chapter 16. Book in Acts chapter 16. Look what's happening. Look what's happening for Paul. Here he is. He's, he's thrust into the inner prison. And when they had laid many stripes on them and cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Isn't that amazing? They had stripes laid on them, they were uh, falsely accused. They were put into the stocks, and, and they're in prison, and here they're sitting there, not saying, oh, me, this is terrible. Look what God's done to me. Look how God allowed this to happen. They're singing praises and songs unto God. Go, if you would, to uh, old First Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse uh, 23. Paul writes here, he says, are they ministers to Christ? I speak as a, as a fool. I am more in labors and more abundant in stripes and measure in precious more uh, in prisons, more frequent and deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of, uh, by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings, often in hunger, in thirst, in fastings, often in cold, in nakedness. Beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. That's a lot. But yet he says in Philippians, I have learned whatever state I am in. I don't know, folks. I think most of us who have gone through all that Paul went through, we would either say, I quit, or man, God doesn't care for me, or man, we just would get discouraged. But Paul says, I have learned and despite all that's happened to me, that is where God has brought me to. As I was ministering, I am content and satisfied to be in that position. Why? Because he trusted in God. Now, look, uh, uh, he was beaten. Their focus uh, and, uh, and so forth. In 2 Corinthians, he goes through there. Now, here's the thing. Contentment is, determined, is not determined by my circumstance, but by my focus. Their focus when they were singing was on God. Contentment comes when my focus is on God despite my circumstance. Contentment does not come from without, but from within. My situation in life should not affect my contentment. 
I, if I keep my focus on God who loves me and controls all things. Contentment is not by having more or a change of circumstance. There's just another problem around the corner. You ever heard the phrase? The old phrase, if it wasn't for bad luck, I would have no luck at all. You know, I, I can say, man, today it's all great, but tomorrow it may not be. May not be. <laughs> this month, uh, uh, it, if I was sharing with someone else, it's been an interesting month. Mother-in-law passed away. Then my mm -hmm. aunt passed away. And then my sister's husband, my brother-in-law's father passed away. But man, there's a lot going on. But those are circumstances. And when you go through them and face them, I still have contentment in my heart because God is in control. My situation shouldn't affect my contentment. Contentment is not by having more or a change in circumstance. There's just another problem. Everything we have can be taken and gone in a moment. But we always have God. So we focused on him and his great love for us and rehearsed all he has done. God always acts in love. That is who he is. I want to take you back to a story in Judges. I want you to see something that's happening to Gideon. How many are familiar with Gideon, who he was? Gideon was uh, a part of the judge, one of the judges. During the time when the children of Israel was at a point where they would sin and God would send them into captivity. And then in captivity, they were there for a while and they would cry out to God and he would send a deliverer to deliver them from one of the enemies. Right now, the children of Israel, when we come to Gideon, they are under uh, the kind of bondage from someone called, from a group called the Midianites. And things were so bad they, they, the, what they would do, they'd go out and plant crops to feed themselves. But after they planted the crops, they, the, Indian, India, the enemy would come in and burn them all down. So we find Gideon, where we're going to start reading, he is hiding behind a wine press, having to, to make wheat or bread so that the Midianites would not capture him or find it and destroy what they had. So he's there. And when you get a picture of what he's doing, you kind of get the idea when he begins to talk with this angel, with the angel, God, that there's a bitterness in him about what's going on. But I want to, I want to show you what he does because he does something that so many times we do. If you look at Judges chapter 6, Midian is there and he's, he's threshing wheat and he's hiding. And the angel of the Lord appears on him because what's going to happen, God is getting ready to deliver them from bondage. And he's going to use Gideon to do it. Now, Gideon don't think much of himself. He don't think he's the right guy. But yet God is going to call upon him. But I want you to see what Gideon does. Because sometimes this is how we act when we face problems or, or needs and things going on. Look what he says. And the angel of the Lord in verse 12, this is Gideon, Judges chapter 6. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So the, here, here this angel comes and praises Gideon. But look what Gideon says. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us from the hand of uh, taken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. What did Gideon just do there? Think about it. He, he allowed his situation to control his idea of God, his love of God. He's looking at the situation and they're striking it. Certainly he's, he's bitter and angry because why is this happening to them? And God, this angel appears and calls him the great man of valor. And his first thing to the angel is, well, if God is really for us, why is this happening? Do you ever think of that? I mean, we all probably at some time thought, man, God, I, I thought you were with me. Man, look what's happening in my life. But what he did, he shrunk God down to his situation. Instead of lifting God beyond the situation, 
knowing God is in full control. See, we do that. We take our circumstance and we envision God based on our circumstances. Well, he really don't care for me. You know, wow, what's he going to do? I'm here and sure, yeah, yeah, God loves me. Why did this happen? Why did you allow the car go bad? Why did you allow the bill to come in that I just don't have money to pay this week? And they said it has to be paid or they're going to shut me down. Why, God, why did you uh, allow uh, myself to get hurt and I can't go to work and now I have these bills? God, why did you allow my kids to get sick? And sometimes more extreme. Why did God take someone home that's very close to us or young or that, that we love? Things happen. So Gideon asks why and reduces his view of God according to what is going on in his life. And he is using his situation to define who God is. And here's the thing in our life, folks. I may never fully understand why things happen in my life. I may not fully understand. I might know. Sometimes I may not fully understand why God allowed this in my life. Because what's interesting in the story, the angel doesn't answer him. The angel doesn't quantify his statement. The angel say, oh, you know God loves you and all that. He doesn't. He just tells Gideon that he's going to deliver Israel. And he tells Gideon to go and prepare. And you know the story. And they end up, they end up having a great victory with only 300 men. Now think about that. That's just a sound. He's not one I want to preach on. But then he ends up taking Gideon from the threshing floor, scared and mad at God. And God who loves doesn't love me to a victory on a hillside with 300 men where they bust open lanterns. And that's all they do. They bust up lanterns and lights, and the, the, they end up, the many nights end up killing themselves and going on, going on. Great victory. He had come a long way from, I don't, God, I don't think you love me. Why do you love us? How can you say that to a great victory? See, focusing on God is being able to say, I do not know, but God does, and he is sovereign. He has promised, as we saw in our verses, he will never leave me nor forsake me or leave me alone. There is my contentment. Every circumstance with, uh, uh, every circumstance I need to look at, at it with the backdrop of the cross. God's love never changes and God never changes. And all that he's done for me. Folks, I can never replace it, can I? I can never, ever live up totally to what God has done for me. Going and paying for me and to sacrifice a sin in my life and, and giving me salvation, even salvation. It, it just astounds me. God doesn't say, here's salvation. I will save you, give you eternal home in heaven, eternal uh, peace. You have to do this and this and this. It's just free. By me believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, believing on him. How, how, can I, how can you ever imagine that someone would take and say, I'm going to set aside all your, your wrongs and in the things you've done bad and your thoughts and everything you've done. I'm going to set all that aside and forgive you and give you all the eternal heavens that I have in store for you. And not only stop there, I'm not only going to give it to you despite what you've done. I'm going to give it to you despite how you fail in the process. After you're there, how many times you mess it up. It's still yours. It doesn't change. It's because he always sees me not by what I am or doing, but through the blood of Jesus Christ. He always sees me in that righteousness, not because, uh, not because of, uh, of, of the good things I'm doing. He sees me still in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He gives me his spirit. He covers me with that righteousness. And he did it for free. Just me believing. But he paid the sacrifice. How can I ever get over that? I need to always look at every situation in my life and say, you know, despite what's happening, I may not understand it. I don't know how to fix it. And here's a circumstance. But man, look what God's done for me. I know he loves me. And I know he cares. 
Contentment isn't determined by my circumstances, but by my focus. Contentment is learned confidence in God's strength. Learn confidence in God's strength. Go back, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. I want you to see what Paul gives his instructions because here, here is where we learn. Look what he says. He says, I have learned. I have learned. Now, here's what you understand, folks. Confidence and contentment isn't something that just comes naturally. We learn it through life experience to trust God. There is contentment. He says, I have learned whatever state. That's the position and place I am. Paul's learning came from a lot of pain, suffering, and good blessings. It's not easy and it doesn't come naturally, but it develops into trust and contentment. Paul gives a contrast. And look how he goes through this. Paul says this. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Now, I want you to think beside that word. Abased simply means I know how to be made low. To suffer, to be low. Abound means I know how to prosper and things go well. But then he goes on, he uses a term here. I'm going to explain it to you in a minute because he says, I am instructed both to be what? Full. That means having plenty. And he says, I have been instructed to be hungry. That's not enough. Then he goes on, he says, uh, uh, both to be full and be hungry, just both to abound. Here the abound is to have what I need and more. And the other, and it says, and to suffer need. That means lack what is needed. The word instructed here just kind of struck me. What, when he says instructed, where is the instruction? That, that word, if you look at it in Greek and understand it, 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 it has the idea he has been initiated into a secret on how to be content. It means, means what he's looking at with the abound and with the suffer and the hungry and the fool. He has been initiated to the lesson that, that we're taught by trials, is what he's saying. My instruction through trials, what I have learned, that in the state and the things, there's something I've learned in that, that, that he's talking about in that instruction. And what that is, what that is I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. Look what he says in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's the instruction. That is the secret that Paul has come up with as he looked at his trials and he went through his trials and he went through what he suffered. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can face all those trials. I can be abased. I can abound. I can be hungry. I can be full. I cannot have enough. I can have more than enough at times. I have learned that through all those things, I can do it all. I can get through it all. I can make through it all because he loves me. It's Jesus Christ who strengthens me. See, I, my contentment doesn't come in my strength. It comes in his strength working in me. I get to a place where I don't understand it. Or I, I, I'm dissatisfied with something. Can I face that dissatisfaction? Yes. I can have contentment because Jesus Christ will strengthen me. There is the faith and the focus. There is a secret that Paul's learned that he wants uh, 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 the church to know. Whatever you're facing and going through, here's the secret. God will strengthen you to get through it. Because Paul, Paul has experienced it in his life. He's been instructed by that, that understanding now. He's been taught. He will get through it. So I learn I am able to go through all circumstance of life that may come my way, not by my strength, but God's empowering help. Because it says he is my strength. Contentment is not found on my life situation, but rather on my trust in God. Contentment is not found on how others treat me, but rather my trust in God. Contentment is not founded on having more, but rather my trust in God. Contentment is not trying to figure it all out, past failures and wrongs, but my trust in God. Contentment is found on the inward, not the external. Contentment is learned. 
Then I want you to see contentment is accepting from God's hand what he sends because God is good and controls and in control of it all. You go to Hebrews chapter 13 again. He says, chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. It says, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. What man shall do unto me, but go back then to 1 Timothy, chapter 5. I'm going to break that down for a minute, and we're going to bring things to a close. There's a strange thinking that he's dealing with, but he's talking to Timothy about, which it has to do with covetousness. But he, he says this, he says this in Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, chapter verse 5, his perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. You hear that a lot from preachers, don't you, on TV sometimes. God wants to bless you. You're not meant to be poor. Give me some money or send the church, send here and plant that seed. And all of a sudden you're going to have wealth and all your bills are going to be okay. As if that is godliness. I want you to understand what godliness here. When he goes on, he says, but godliness with contentment. Godliness is living in a way that reflects God. Hope you understand that. Godliness is living in a way that is how God would be react or Jesus would be. If, if you would go, and we're not going to go there, but if you would go to uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 and verses 44 through 45, what you see Jesus is telling them, if you see me, you see the Father. But he also says, tells them that uh, you live your life so that when people see your good works, they glorify who? The Father. See, my life is a reflection of what God is supposed to be, is like. And my life, when I live it, is supposed to reflect who God is. And he tells him godliness, that, that image, that living for God. But he says, doing it with contentment is great gain. Because in doing that, sometimes the troubles come and the problems come and, and you face things. But you do it with contentment, satisfied. I am doing what's right. I will never, and then he, and then he goes on and he, he tells him, but God is the contentment is great gain for I brought nothing to this world. And if it's certain, we can carry nothing now. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare into many foolish, hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And you understand contentment is accepting from God's hand what he sends because God is good and control of it all. Contentment. So the question is, when we mentioned earlier about Joseph. Joseph looks at his brothers after they had betrayed him. And he says to them in chapter of Genesis 50, verse 20, he says, but as for you, you thought it evil for evil, evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day the same to save much people alive. You know the story. They had brothers had betrayed him, sold him, and he's down in Egypt. He goes after years up to a place of authority. And one day, those brothers that betrayed him have to come to Egypt and get food for their family because in their land there was famine. And in the in the whole land and they have to come, and they think Joseph is dead. Joseph one day is all of a sudden there, and finally he confronts his brothers. They're feared for their life because they thought, well, he's going to retaliate, but he doesn't retaliate. He shows them kindness and forgiveness, and he tells them, what you did, you thought you meant it for evil. You meant to kill me. You, you had a purpose that was bad, but I want to tell you something. What you did, you thought it was bad. But God meant it for good. 
Now, if you would study Joseph's wife in prison and betrayed and lied about and all that he had to go through and lying in prison and was supposed to have been a, a, a baker, or was supposed to um, help him get lifted, or butler. Well, I don't know which one died. I'm not sure. One of them got killed. Butler or a baker. But you know, he was able to look back on his life, all the years that it took to get there, and he could say, look, you guys, you meant bad. God meant it for good, for such a time as this. And sometimes, folks, contentment comes into our life when I can accept what God sends my way, not understanding it, but saying God has a purpose for it that I don't see right now. And God has something maybe teaching me that I need to know now. Or God has something working in some way that I don't see, but God means it for good. Contentment is accepted from God. So hope when it comes down to it, God will sometimes allow bad things in your life for a greater purpose. That's hard for us to accept. I don't like bad things. I like good <laughs> things. I mean, things will always be good, but it doesn't work that way. So sometimes when I look at the problems and the things that happen, I have to say, I understand it, God, but I think you must have a greater purpose. I don't see what's going on, but if there's something I need to learn, help me learn. If it's going to make me trust you more, and then help me, Lord, to find that trust. I don't like it, God, but I have contentment in my heart that you're in control of it and that you love me and you have a reason. Help me understand it and help me go through it. And if not, Lord, just help me trust you. And I have a contentment that God's in control. How else can we face the problems of life? Even in our country, when things seem so divided, it's really not new. If you go back to the beginning, there was division. But the things that bother you now is the morals and stuff that we, that we, it was just so, you know, you just look at it, you think that is what was wrong. That is wrong, but now it's made as it's just normal. We look at all those things and we, 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 get, we get worried and what's going to happen. But even with all that, God has a purpose, even in our country and in, 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 in where we're at. We have to understand it. God's going to play out his will. And sometimes in playing out his will, we do suffer need or we do suffer. And we may not understand it. But God's got a great purpose. You want contentment? Rest in God. That's where it goes. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you that. No matter what we face in this life, I can have contentment because I know you never leave me. You will never forsake me. You will always be there. Even, God, when I don't see your hand working, I must see that you are working even because there is that problem. And Lord, help me to trust that because then I can live with contentment, knowing you're there and that you hear me. And you answer prayer. And Lord, that you have a greater purpose than I understand. And sometimes, Lord, you just want us to say, I trust you. Lord, I pray you bring contentment to our hearts. Whatever someone in this room may be facing in their life. They may not like it. And this discontent in the situation, that's the outward God. But give them the contentment of heart that you love them. And you're there for them. So, Lord, bless now and thank you for this time. Thank you for your wonderful grace in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, sir.